players, if you will, or the combatants are Judah, led by uh, King Hezekiah, and mainly within the, in the area of Jerusalem is where the attack's going to take place. And then we have Assyria, led by uh, King Sennacherib and his, uh, his cohort there, probably some kind of a general or somebody that's actually leading the army of the Assyrians. And I like the guy's name, man. You have to like that name, Rabshakeh. All right. I'm not, I don't know if I'm saying it right, but I just like saying it, Rabshakeh, you know. So anyways, um, let's go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started in our study as we look at uh, a little bit of Hezekiah's life and against the Assyrians. Our Father, we do want to thank you for this time you've given us here today. Lord, we thank you for the safe drives that uh, you brought us here safely this morning, Lord, and we pray for those that will be traveling for services. Lord, may you give them safety. We also pray for those that are and I'm able to make it this morning, maybe because of traveling, uh, also sickness and illness, but we pray, Father, you'd uh, just strengthen and encourage their hearts. Father, now I look for your help this morning as we look at uh, this time period in uh, Judah's history, or re it really Israel's history, and Father, just uh, give us some wisdom, and then also, Lord, encourage us through your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so as we look at this and look at the little bit of the background and the history of it uh, again uh, looking at this time frame but i want to start back a little bit take a look at who the assyrians are and where they really come from so as we look at the history of the assyrians and and again a lot of this is based on we want to our bible the the word of god is really our main um, focus when we're looking at historical events of course it's really focusing on the history of israel right and, but there are other outside sources that collaborate with what's said in here, and especially a lot of the archaeological um, findings, really no finding in archaeological history that I'm aware of and that I've read about has disproved the Bible. There are some maybe little changes here and there, mainly with names and some time frames, because each, each uh, nation may use a little different calendar than what Israel did or what, what even what we do nowadays. So... Um, the Assyrians descended from, actually, from uh, Shem's son, Asher, and that's found in Genesis chapter 10, uh, verse 22, and Assyria derives its name from, basically, from Asher, and uh, the, when it first started as a civilization at way back in uh, about 2000, 2600 BC, um, they, uh, it was known as Alu Asur, or city of Asher, or Mat Asur, land of Asher. So it was pretty of a small area, if you will, and if you're looking at kind of where that is, and so this would be basically modern Iraq is right here, so you have the Euphrates River down here, Babylon is down here, Babylonia is down here, the Tigris River, so right along the Tigris River is, is where the Assyrian Empire, if you will, whoops, got one, one too fast there, is where the Assyrian um, civilization started was right in this area, and it gets its name again from from this Asher. That was also the god that they worshipped. That was their first capital, if you will. And there are several capitals in Assyria's history, and by the time we get to Hezekiah, um, Nineveh becomes the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And of course, that is Nineveh right up, right up here, again, right along the Tigris River. We're familiar with Nineveh, uh, especially when you read the, the book of Jonah, right? Because God sends Jonah to... Um, to preach to Nineveh to get them to repent because Nineveh, you know, because Assyria was very wicked. And of course, Jonah, he refuses. He didn't want to. Yeah. He, he's mad at God even for, for that God wants to even show them mercy. I find that's kind of interesting because I know in my own life, and I don't know if it's about with you, but sometimes there's been times in my life, and maybe even now I may look on a people or a people's group or, or whatever, and I may say, you know, they don't deserve to be saved. But that's not true, you know. And this is a good point here because Assyria was very, very wicked. And they were also, when, when they conquered a nation, man, they, they were devastating to a nation. And very, very cruel when they, when they came to the nation. So Assyria, when by the time that we get around that time, just before about Hez, um, uh, Hezekiah's father, maybe his father a little bit, right about in that time frame of Hezekiah, Assyria really uh, stretches out their empire. And you can see in this, this one photo here, basically, or picture, um, they go all the way from the Persian Gulf and all the way up Mesopotamia, this area right here, all the way up into, into Turkey 
and then all the way down what's called the Levant or the east, basically. You got Syria and Canaan and, and part of Jordan all the way, and they stretch all the way down, and their influence impacts all the way down the Nile River into Egypt. So it was a pretty big, at that time, it was the largest empire that had ever been in the world at that time. And they also had, Assyria had the largest army that had ever been assembled uh, in the world at about that period of time. And so they took over a lot of the area. And when you look at it, what the Assyrians thought was that they thought they had some divine decree from their god, Asher, to take over to, to expand their lands. I find that kind of interesting because when we look at back, in, back when uh, uh, in Genesis, when the Lord told the, the people, right, he said, I want you to go out in the land and, you know, occupy the land and spread out. Of course, they didn't do that, and they settled in Babylon, and we know some of that story. So they get some of this account uh, from even from back at that time. So their um, empire at the height stretched in that whole area there. Again, as I mentioned, they had a very powerful army. They were also, they had a lot, when you look at some of the some of the artifacts that they had, they, a lot of arts and a very pretty high level of civilization back then, the things that they designed, the things that they developed and they did. And they were also, like I said, they were very cruel in their treatment. And Israel really detested them. And that's why Jonah, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. He didn't want Assyrians to be, you know, to repent and turn to the Lord because of their cruelty. So uh, eventually what's going to happen is in about 609 B.C., right around that time, Assyria is going to get defeated by a coalition of uh, the Medes, who are kind of basically that Persian area, um, and then also Babylon. And that's really the start of Babylonian Empire. It started way back when. There was always these wars and skirmishes and battles between Assyria and Babylon. And Assyria pretty much had kind of control over Babylon for the most part. But Babylon is going to gather some of the nations around them, some of the other kings. They're going to join up with the Medes, and they're going to actually attack Assyria, attack Assyria and they're going to overthrow Assyria. Assyria, that civilization, really is going to continue on well into about uh, 200 A.D., so after um, uh, about 200 A.D., and they say even some of the commentaries say there's still some remnants of people that can always trace their lineage back to the Assyrians. So it's uh, a little bit of history of, of Assyrian where they came from. So now we uh, start looking at the background, kind of the background of the battle, if you will. And we want to start really with King Ahaz. Assyria at this time, as I mentioned, they're really starting to grow. They're pushing their boundaries, and they're, they're starting to um, develop this large empire, if you will. Uh, the king of Assyria at that time, Tilgath Pilsner, was, was really pushing the boundaries and had already started to move and come up into the area of Syria at that time and was starting to push down into that area and take over the, the Levant, if you will. And want to pick up the account there in 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17, or um, 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, began Hosea, the son of Elot. Whoops, I, I'm in the wrong, wrong verse there. That's not what the one I wanted. Uh, 2 Kings, sorry, 2 Kings 16, verse 1. There we go. That's a little better. In the 17th year of Pekah, the king of Judah began to reign. Twenty years old was Ahaz when he began to reign, and reigned sixteen years in Jerusalem, and did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord his God, like David his father. But he walked in the way of the kings of Israel, yea, and made his son pass through the fire according to the abominations of the heathens, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. He sacrificed and burned incense in high places and on the, high, on the hills and under every golden tree. And then verse 5 says, Then Rezin, king of Syria, uh, and Pekah, son of uh, Ramalia, king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to war, and they besieged Ahaz, but could not overcome him. If you would look at the same account over in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, and verse 19, it says, The Lord brought Judah low because Ahaz, king of Israel, for he made Judah naked and transgressed sore against the Lord. With well, the idea there is he made Judah um, naked. Basically, he just really 
took the reli- took the um, the worship of the true God, the God of Israel. He took that completely away and brought in the worship all these idols and and all these abominations that we just read about. And so the Lord now is going to really judge Ahaz and and Judah for for that sin. And really, again, he's trying to get he's trying to get Ahaz to turn away from the direction that he was going and bring Judah back on the right track. And so what he does, he allows not only Syria, as we just read there, but he allows Syria to come down. And Syria, of course, up here, they're going to come down into Judah, and they're going to attack Judah. Israel, mainly Ephraim, but a lot of Israel here is going to come down and start attacking Judah. But not only that, but you have the Philistines over here. They're going to come over from the southwest and attack. And then you have Edom coming down here, and they're going to come up from the south. So basically, all sides of, here's you got Judah, and you got Jerusalem right there, and everybody's coming down against them. And they're not all be able to really overthrow Judah at that time, but there's a lot of battles that are going on. And what happens is the Syrians overtake a lot of the towns in in Judah, and they take a lot of captives away. Israel comes down. They take a bunch of hundreds of thousands of captives and kill a bunch of the soldiers. Edom does the same thing, and the Philistines all take over all these little towns. And so you have all this attack going on from all these directions. And so Ahaz is sitting there. He's in the middle, and he's trapped. And this was all from the Lord, allowing the Lord allowing this to do this. So what does he do? Well, he what he does is he's gonna he feels like he doesn't have any recourse. He doesn't turn to the Lord because he doesn't trust the Lord. He hasn't been following the Lord. He doesn't turn to the Lord. The one person, the one place he should have gone was to the Lord, but he doesn't do that. Instead, he goes to Assyria, and Assyria. You know, it's kind of like what's that phrase? You're the enemy of my enemy is my friend, or whatever that goes. I may have said that wrong or something like that. And that's what you almost have. Assyria was a very strong, powerful nation. Ahaz had looked to, to uh, Egypt, but Egypt wasn't strong enough at that time. Egypt had been overthrown. They weren't near the power. Assyria was the mighty power at that time. So he turns to Assyria, and uh, Assyria, so basically you have the king coming over, um, and they're already kind of on the do- doorstep of Syria, and so they come down through here, and they attack, and, As- and Syria ends up falling to Assyria. Got to keep those two names right. <laughs> Anyways, um, and that's found in 2 Kings chapter 16, 7 through 9. Now, it's interesting because then what happens is Ahaz, he's going to go up to Damascus, because now uh, Syria's in Damascus. Ahaz goes up to Damascus to meet with the king, and he says, you know, I want you to help me to overcome Edom and Israel and also Philistines. And, and the king of Assyria says, no, I'm not going to help you. I'm going to take all your money. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to come down and I'm going to attack you, Judah, and I'm going to put you, make you my servant. So what happens is Ahaz now, he's kind of stuck. He doesn't have help. He still has these other guys coming up into and attacking him, so he's kind of stuck. Assyria is going to come down. He knows he can't defeat Assyria. So he starts paying him tribute. So he basically becomes, Ahaz, Hezekiah's father, becomes servants to Assyria. And so that kind of sets the stage as we start moving into the life and that, the battle with, with Hezekiah. So after that, shortly after that, it's interesting because then um, really Ahaz in some ways, some respects, really kind of set the stage. Now we know it's from the Lord because the Lord had been judging Israel, but Assyria finally attacks and takes Israel captive during Hezekiah's reign. So basically during his reign is when Assyria takes them captive. So they'd been that battling. They'd been battling. They'd put Samaria under siege for over three years, and they finally overcame Samaria and then took them all captive. And it's hard to see in this this drawing here, but basically what you have is you have Assyrian uh, taking Israel captive, um, and then they basically take all the captives and most of Israel, and they just disperse them all along this area where Assyria, all the way out here, and they just kind of dispersed them throughout their kingdom at that time. They left a few people, in, in Israel, the weak, the sick, the, the poor, they left a lot of some of those people. They would become known as the Samaritans, of course, and we read about them in the New Testament. So that, uh, so that kind of brings us to this point of where we are in Hezekiah and this battle with Assyria, because now Assyria is right on the doorstep, if you will. They're, they've taken over Israel, they've defeated the Philistines, and uh, they're going to continue on uh, 
um, down, that, down that whole area and, and moving into Egypt and uh, overtaking Egypt. So we move into Hezekiah's reign. If you want to look over at, actually, let's see, I don't know if I have the verses up here. No, I don't. Uh, so if you want to open up your Bibles to uh, 2 Kings, you got chapter 18. So you can just move over there. See if we can stay in this, and I think we can pick up most of this. We get an idea, but from both uh, 2 Kings chapter 18, but also from 2 Chronicles um, chapter number uh, 29 through 32, we get the same idea here. But what we're going to see is we're going to see how Hezekiah is going to start his reign. Now think about this. Remember what Ahaz was like. Ahaz didn't have any relationship with the Lord. He was he worshipped idols. He he uh, sacrificed his children. He led Judah away from the Lord. They were defeated. He was a servant. He left Judah as a servant to Assyria. They were paying tribute to Assyria so they wouldn't get attacked. And so this is how Hezekiah starts his reign. And Hezekiah is about, uh, as we're going to see here, uh, chapter 18, uh, starting at verse number, uh, number 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's, na his mother's name also was Abi, Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 3, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That is amazing. We've read that before in some different other kings where you had this father that was just totally just like the king, kings of Israel. And that son, the Lord protected him, you know, because the Lord was protecting all the way through, right? He promised that there would always be a son of David who sit on the throne. Amen. And so he didn't, he didn't allow Ahaz to be removed because of that promise, even though Ahaz was very evil, and very wicked, and didn't follow or love the Lord. But he still let him do that. He knew Hezekiah. He knew who Hezekiah was going to be. Hezekiah wasn't perfect, but he still he followed the Lord. In fact, in one place it talks about Ahaz, they refer to him as the king of Israel, which is kind of interesting. A couple of different possibilities is one, Israel really is the nation that the house of David is over. It's not just these two tribes of Judah. But the other idea gives you the idea is that he was so much like the kings of Israel, they refer to him as a king of Israel. So that's a side note. That's extra. Won't cost you anything. Yeah. And so anyway, so we have Hezekiah. He's, he's, uh, he really has a, has a good relationship. He's doing what's right. He's following the Lord. So let's see what he does. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord re, um, according to all that David his father did. Verse 4, he removed the high places and break the images and cast down the groves, break in pieces the brace and serpent, the Moses made. So all the idols, all the type of idol worshiping that there were, idols and groves, and we've read a lot about these things before. He gets, he removes all those things. So he's really setting the, starting to set the stage because right now Hezekiah as the king is making these decisions. He's leading Judah at this point. He's being a good example of what to do, of how to lead this nation, of how to bring them back to the Lord. First thing you want to do is he get rid of all those removed idols. The next thing he's going to do is he's going to um, restore, the, restore the temple. And uh, uh, you'll see that, and we won't turn over there for right now, but he's going to restore the temple, temple worship. He's going to uh, restore the Passover. He's going to restore all the, all the Levites, their jobs and everything. And that's all found in 2 Chronicles 29 through uh, basically 32. So you can read about that. We won't go there for, for sake of time. But he's going to restore the temple worship. And then the next thing he's going to do, he's going to restore and um, he's going to be resolved to worship the Lord. So he makes a, he makes a covenant with the Lord. He's going to, I'm going to worship you and I'm going to serve you and I'm going to minister to you. So here's the leader of Judah who didn't have a good, you know, father. His grandfather was better, but he didn't really have a good father example. But he becomes this example for Judah and he makes that resolution to follow the Lord. And then also what he's going to do, he challenges Judah then to also follow after the Lord. And he, we talk about that. Uh, let's see. That's also found in, in Second Chronicles. Maybe we'll go ahead and we can flip over there. I think I have the spot here. If I don't lose my pages. Kind of have to go back and forth to get the, get the whole account here and the whole story of what's going on. 
So uh, first three of chapter 29, Second Chronicles 29, verse 3. It says, uh, he, that's Hezekiah, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. That's restoring the temple. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street, said unto them, Hear ye, hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify the house of the Lord God uh, of your fathers and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. Get rid of the sin. Get rid of the idol worship. Get rid of all those things that that the Lord detests us against the Lord. Uh, For our fathers have transpassed, or trespassed, and done that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God, and have forsaken him, and have turned away their faces from habitation of the Lord, and turned their backs. Also they have shut up the doors of the porch, and put out the lamps, and have not burned incense, nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place unto the God of Israel. So Hezekiah knew all this. He had been trained, he had been taught what the worship was. He'd been taught what the, what the priest's job were to do. He had been taught that it was that they were supposed to burn the incense and have this continually going in, in the temple and, and, and all of that that was going on. He'd, he'd been taught all that, certainly not by his dad. Wherefore, the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah, verse 8, and Jerusalem, and he hath delivered them uh, to trouble and astonishment and to hissing as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword and our sons and daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord of God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not neg- negligent for the Lord hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him that you should minister unto him and burn incense. And then he goes on and then uh, temple is going to temple's uh, going to be restored at the end of chapter 29 chapter 30 you have the preparation of the passover and the celebration of the passover 31 and verse 1 um, you have uh, all the idols are destroyed verse 1 of chapter 31 in second chronicles now when all this was finished uh, all Israel that were present went out to the cities of Judah and break the images and pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places and the altars out of all Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim uh, also and Manasseh until they had every man to his pose- uh, possession and to their own cities. And so and then he's going to encourage and challenge the, si- the children of, of Judah and the children of Israel to set themselves apart holy unto the Lord, to sanctify themselves. Not only the priests, but also the people should set themselves apart to serve the Lord. And then he is also going to, he encourages them and challenges them to remove the sin. Remove the sin out of the temple. Remove the sin out of your own lives. And then also to not neglect the commandments of the Lord. So he's going to challenge them that. And then finally, what he he talks about in in, uh, his life here is he trusted the Lord. So he's going to trust the Lord. He refused to serve Assyria, and then he also fortified the land. And what we see in this, in this one figure over here, basically you have, uh, you have at this time, he's going to um, reject Assyria, so he's going to stop paying that tribute that his dad had started. He's not going to serve Assyria anymore because he got, I'm going to trust the Lord. I don't need to trust this nation to protect me anymore. The Lord's going to protect us. The Lord's going to help us. The Lord's going to be our deliverer. And so he, he rejects the, um, the um, Assyria. But then also during that time, he's going to, the Lord's going to bless him, and they're going to increase their land, and they're going to push, they're going to push into and take a lot back a lot of the towns that the Philistines would take over. So they're going to push out the Philistines. They're going to come down here. They're going to push out the, the Edomites and take back a lot of the towns down here. And they're going to push out some of Israel and, and uh, this going up north. And, and they're going to take back a lot of the towns. And then what he's going to do, he's going to end up fortifying a lot of those towns in preparation, in anticipation that, you know what? I'm pushing back on the enemy because I'm following the Lord. I know the enemy is not going to like that. And so I expect I'm going to be prepared for the attack of the enemy because I know the enemy because I'm pushing on him, I'm refusing him, I'm rejecting him, and I'm following the Lord. Therefore, the enemy is going to come on me. And I'm going to expect that. So I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to push out all these nations that are having a bad influence on us, that are taking over our cities. I'm going to fortify these things because I'm going to be prepared so when that enemy comes and attacks me, I'm going to be ready 
And so and that's, what's, that's what he does during this time. So it's not very long, of course, that the king of Assyria at that time, Sennacherib, he's you know, hears about this, and he's not going to take this. He's not going to take this lightly. So b- about 701 uh, B.C., the Assyrians, um, uh, Sennacherib's going to invade Judah, and they're going to take a lot of these towns. Second uh, Kings 18, 13 says, Now in the 14th year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against the fenced cities of Judah and took them. So th- from the time that we just read, where it said in the first year he did all this stuff with the temple and all this, it's been about 13 years. So all this time that Hezekiah has been pushing out these nations and fortifying these towns has been about 14 years. Well, Sennacherib's finally coming down, and what he does first off is he comes against a lot of these northern cities up here, but he goes right down the side here, and he starts taking a lot of these towns. And then he's going to end up, uh, the king of Egypt, Hezekiah is going to call on the king of Egypt to come up and help him. The king of Egypt's going to come up, Man, Sennacherib and and Assyria is just going to wipe them out. And so Egypt, they just continue right on down. So now Assyria is up here in the north. They're down along the coast here in the east, and they're swung around down kind of around the south, and they're getting ready, and they're going to swing up. They're going to come right up. So they're going to basically come right up from the side over here. They're going to come down, knock out all these towns and everything here, take out Egypt, and they're going to swing back up around, and they're going to head right up to Jerusalem. And so now Hezekiah is sitting there, and he's, he sees what's happening. A lot of these things that are going on, he's hearing what's going on. So what he does is we pick it up again, and Hezekiah knew that Sennacherib's armies were going to turn on Jerusalem. He said about preparing the city to withstand the siege. So now he figures, okay, Sennacherib's coming up, and they're going to they're gonna lay siege to Jerusalem. And back in those days, you know, they just didn't attack, and most of us are familiar with it. They just didn't come out fully attack a city. Well, what they would do is they would lay siege, and what that means is that they would surround the city with, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of soldiers, and they would cut off food sources, they would cut off armies, they would cut off water, they would cut off everything in the city basically to try to starve them out, right? And they would just sit there because they could continue to supply all their needs. They didn't have to fight, they didn't have to lose the battles or anything, they would just sit and they would wait them out. And they knew if they tried to come out and attack them, they would, over, they would overcome them. So Hezekiah now, they're in Jerusalem. So we've got to figure out what we're going to do to protect ourselves before Sennacherib comes up and lays siege to us. We've got to be prepared again. So now they're going to work on the inside of their um, own defenses. Second Chronicles 32, verse 2 and 5. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib was come and that he was purposed to fight against Jerusalem, that's Sennacherib against Jerusalem, he strengthened himself, built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the up to the towers and another wall without and separated milo in the city of david and made darts and shields in abundance so basically he's building up his defenses inside there he's going to build up this wall basically here's here's uh, jerusalem is is right right in here and he's going to build this build up this wall all the way around so he's and he's going to build up these towers and then he's going to also build arrows darts or spears right and shields he's going to get his army ready they're going to be standing on those walls ready prepared for when the syrians come to attack and lay siege and so the next thing that he does the other thing that he does which is interesting he knows that one of the one of the things the enemy is going to attack he's going to cut off my water supply right so we got to figure out what are we going to do to protect us so we don't end up you know succumbing to thirst or or what have you and so what he's going to do, he's going to end up, um, oh yeah, I forgot, he's uh, got this wall. That, actually, that picture right there is, is a portion of Hezekiah's wall that they found. So they, archaeological, during the 1970s, they found just a portion of this wall, 18 feet wide, 20, or 22 feet wide. That's a, that's a wide, that's a lot of wall. That's what he built. So during that time, he built this wall all the way around the city, 22 feet wide, 25 feet high. And that's kind of what it looked like right there. So they just gathered up all those rocks and they built this wall to try to protect them. So um, one of the things that's interesting, this, this drawing right over here is actually what they call this the Sennacherib's uh, prism. It's kind of like a, a historical document, if you will. Of course, you know, not on papyrus, but actually on, on stone. And it talks about this battle. And like I mentioned before, the archaeological stuff, you know, so they, a lot, for a long time, up until almost the 70s, a lot of people really doubted about Hezekiah building this big wall. And then they find it, 
right? Archaeological, they find it. It supported the Bible. A long time they didn't believe that, that this whole battle between Sennacherib and Hezekiah really existed. And then they find this prism. This prism is actually an Assyrian prism. So this is not from, um, from Israel or anything. But what it talks about is, down at the bottom, you can read part of that, what they were able to interpret it like that, is as Hezekiah. So this is Sennacherib talking, basically. It says, as, as to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. Boy, does, that's just exactly what the Bible talks about, right? Amen. He stopped paying tribute. He stopped serving the Lord. He did not uh, submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities, that's when they went through and they took all those cities and came up and came up to Jerusalem, just like with the uh, walled forts and countless small cities in their vicinity and conquered them. Hezekiah, that's, I put that there, I made uh, a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. With pride, Sennacherib had to, to say this at this time, is that he thought he had them beat, Right? Well, he didn't know Hezekiah was relying upon the Lord ultimately, right? So what does it say? Me and the Lord, you know, one person in the Lord is mightier than all the armies in the world, right? And that's what we got here. So he's, he's got a lot of pride that he shows there. And this is all written right, right on this, this prism that they found. So Hezekiah now, because of the water supply, get back to where I was before I forgot I had that other slide there. Um, he's going to build this. This, this is really amazing when you think about it. If you ever get a chance, read about this tunnel that Hezekiah had constructed so that they would have water during this, when they laid siege to him. So they're going to they're gonna build this tunnel, and uh, it's about 1,700 feet long, and it kind of twists along there. You can kind of see that in this drawing right here, it's basically it comes right along here, and it just twists, and most of this is all underground. They're going to start in the middle and they're going to work towards or they start at each end and they're going to work towards the middle and come to the middle now that's that's without any modern engineering lee they you know they didn't have the transects and the the survey equipment that you have now or now your son has or anything like that they didn't have that stuff and so they started and they met in the middle it's pretty amazing going through rock so this is uh, um, actually a picture of the pool of salome down here so this was one end Right, so that's um, the pic the slome right here. Upper pool is down here, so this is the slome. So this was one starting point right down here, and then the other part, the G the Gihon Spring, is right up in this area here, and then Hezekiah's tunnel. Second Chronicles thirty two three through four says he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the fountains which were without the city. And they did help him, so there was gathered much people together who stopped up all the fountains and the brook that ran through the midst of the land, saying. Why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? So not only were they able, because of this tunnel, they were able to redirect the water to where they could use it, but it prevented the Assyrians from using that same water. So now all of a sudden, Assyrians don't have, that don't have a really readily supply of water. Remember, Jerusalem's up high in a mountain. It's not like down in a valley where you got lots of water. So they had, that means they'd have to truck all their, not truck, they didn't have trucks back then. They would have to hike all their water. That's what happens in modern days, right? They'd have to hike all their water up to the town. So, so they, they did this, this tunnel for these couple of purposes. Pretty amazing feat of engineering. There are a lot of other pictures um, that I had in there, but we, we won't go for those for right now. So... So what we have, they have the attack of the enemy, right? So basically, uh, Hezekiah all along has been following the Lord. He'd been uh, walking in his ways. He'd encouraged Judah and Jerusalem to follow the Lord. He'd set up, he'd prepared for this battle that he knew was coming the best that he could with the wisdom of the Lord. And, uh, and Sennacherib's going to come to Jerusalem, and, and they're going to uh, uh, challenge Jerusalem, right? The first one of the things they're going to challenge him, they're going to challenge Hezekiah's authority. First thing they're going to do. And, and Rabshak at that time is kind of yelling up at the people that are there, and he's not talking to Hezekiah, he's not talking to the princes or whatever, but he's talking in their tongue, and he tells them, you know what, Hezekiah, you think Hezekiah is going to help you? There's no way. And then also he's going to challenge any nation. You think Egypt's going to help you? You think these nations? I've already wiped them out. They're not going to help you. And then also he's going to challenge the Lord. So that uh, we see that in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, 9 through 14. After this, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, send his servants, that's Rabshakeh and Etal, to Jerusalem. 
he, he laid siege up to this other town, Lachish, up in uh, just uh, out inside Syria. Um, Hezekiah, uh, unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, unto all Judah that were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of, East, uh, of Assyria, Whereon do ye trust that ye abide in the siege in Jerusalem? Doth not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourselves to die by famine and thirst, saying, The Lord our God shall deliver us out of the hand of king Assyria? Hath not the same Hezekiah taken away the high places and altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, you shall, not, you shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it? Notice he tries to use, his own, he tries to use the Jews' religion against them. You know, he, not understanding. Right? He thinks that all these other gods are just as powerful as the God of Israel. And so he tries to dissuade them. He tries to discourage them. You shall worship... Um, Know ye not that, uh, what I and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands, where the gods of the, uh, of the nations of those lands any ways able to deliver them, deliver their lands out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed, that could, uh, that could deliver his people out of mine hand, that your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand? So basically saying, I destroyed all these other gods. Your God is just one of them. Not going to help. Continues on, 9 through 14. After, the, oops. There we go, 15 through 19. I thought that sounded kind of familiar. Now, therefore, not let, uh, let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this manner, neither yet believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of my hand? And his servant spake yet more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He wrote also letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of the other lands have not delivered their people out of mine hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of mine hand. Then they cried with a loud voice in the Jews' speech unto the people of Jerusalem that were on the wall to affright them and to trouble them, that they might take the city. And they spake against the God of Jerusalem and against the gods of the people of the earth, which were the works of the man's hand. So we see that, uh, again, the challenge there, the challenge of, of uh, Hezekiah's authority and the nations, you know, and they're not going to help you. Not only that, your God is just as like another God. And so Hezekiah, what he's going to do is he's going to go into the um, temple and he's going to request help from Isaiah, the prophet. And so he sends uh, sends a, a person over to Isaiah and he says, you know, Isaiah, I need you to pray for us. And this is why, because Sennacherib and Syria, he's attacking Jerusalem. He's going he's to overrun us. We can't fight him back. We need the help of the Lord. And so Isaiah, he's going to send a message. He's going to pray for them. He's going to send the message back to, um, back to Hezekiah. Thus saith the Lord. Hezekiah, thus saith the Lord. The one that you're trusting, the one that you're relying upon, the one that you asked me to pray for.
up to fight against thee. And then you keep on going, and then he's going to lay out this second challenge that, you know, the Lord's not going to help you. So now Hezekiah, he's still concerned, and rightfully so, because that army is still out there, and there's that promise they're going to come back. And so now what he's going to do, he's going to go back into the temple, and this time he's going to humble himself, and he's going to go to the Lord in prayer. And he's going to, first thing, he's going to reverence the Lord. He's going to lift up the Lord and, and honor him. The Lord, he's going to say, you know what? And maybe we might have been in this position. You know, we're not worthy, Lord, but we know that you're able to do it. Would you bow down to us? Would you come to us? Would you help us? Would you save us? Not for our glory, not for anything for us, but for your glory. That the other nations would see how that you are the God of the universe. There is no other gods but you. There's no other nations that can stand against you, Lord. And so the Hezekiah is asking him to, to glorify himself through this. And uh, again, you can read that in 2 Kings chapter 19, verses 14 through 19, as uh, he received this letter and he goes into the temple and bows down to the Lord and beseeches the Lord to help him out. The Lord then is uh, going to come. He's going to, uh, through, uh, through Isaiah, he's going to assure Hezekiah, reassure Hezekiah that uh, he's going to def um, defend. I like that because it does say that. He says, I'm going to defend Jerusalem. There's not going to be an arrow that's going to be shot into Jerusalem. There's not going to be a soldier. Nothing's going to happen to Jerusalem. I'm defending it. It's like he's putting just his, his hand of protection, this hedge of protection around this Jerusalem. And that's what he promises Hezekiah. Don't worry, man. Stay there. You're going to be fine. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to defend you. But I'm also going to deliver you. He's going to deliver him. And so the Lord delivers him. The Lord ends up sending an angel. Oh, yeah, it just says an angel. Yeah. <laughs> Wipes out the army of Assyria. Amen. Wipes them out. The rest of them, they just flee. They just take off. And uh, Sennacherib, is a, a eventually, he goes back to um, Nineveh. And in Nineveh there, he's, he's assassinated by another group of, of people. So the Lord, again, delivered Hezekiah out of the attack of the enemy. I think that's probably it for right now. So we'll go ahead and, and stop there, and we'll pick up next week, I think, is our got two more i believe um two more battles that we'll take a look at but let's go ahead and uh, close up in a word of prayer our father we do want to thank you for this time again to come together and look into your word uh, father we do pray for the services coming up help us to come ready and prepared to to worship you and spirit and the truth father but also to serve you and um, may you receive all the glory and honor for all that's done for it's in jesus name we pray amen